Okay, everyone, we are back with Echo, and we are going to finish up Ivy's part today. So we have quite a few questions to answer. So have your um, questions in front of you um, that we'll be looking for as we go through the reading. The first one is, how is Kenny similar to Fernando, her brother? So we're going to meet Kenny in this section. Papa repainted the back door of the Yamamoto house again. While Mama repacked all the boxes that Mr. Ward had inspected yesterday afternoon, Ivy hosed the dirt from the front of the house and the porch. They replanted the irises, raked the garden flat, and salvaged some of the seedlings from the clay pots in the shed. Ivy's last gesture before Kenny Yamamoto came home was to hang a small flag with a red border and a white field on the boarded-up front window, one with a blue star. The next morning... The kitchen filled with the smell of beef roasting in the oven and soup simmering on the stove. Before Papa left for the bus station, he stood in the kitchen, put his hands on his hips, and said, Luz, the entire army of the United States of America could not eat all of this food. Mama waved him off. If Fernando was coming home and we were not here, I would want the mother of another soldier to cook for him. But Kenneth Yamamoto is only sharing one meal with us, said Papa, shaking his head. She looked at Papa. I will send him off with extra for his trip. I have used many of our ration coupons, though. Papa winked at Ivy and pointed to the cake on the counter. It is good for us, yes? Ivy grinned and nodded. When Kenny arrived in his khaki uniform, he placed his officer's cap on a table by the door. His head was shaved, and it made his ears look much too big for his head. He spoke quietly and politely, calling Papa Sir and Mama Ma'am. He was far more serious than Ivy had expected, seeming much older than Fernando, even though they were only two years between them. At first, Ivy felt shy around him, but she found herself scooting her chair closer to his, listening to everything he said. He told about his time in Hawaii and how he had been reassigned to another ship. My brother said he is going over soon, in the belly of a big plane, but we don't know where, said Ivy. Can you keep a secret? Ivy smiled and nodded. I love secrets, sometimes. Going over usually means the European theater, said Kennedy. Kenny, so he'll probably be in Italy or France or Germany. I'll be stationed in the same area, but on a ship. As they lingered around the kitchen table, he and Papa did most of the talking. At first, the conversation was about the recent events on the farm, how Ivy had discovered the music room, and what had happened with Mr. Ward. Then it became about the war, where it was heading, and how long it might last. Serious talk. But when Papa got up to get more coffee and Mama was clearing dishes, Kenny reached over and pulled Ivy's braid, exactly as Fernando used to do. She didn't complain as she might have if it had been Fernando. Instead, she giggled. After lunch, Kenny said, I'd like to go see my house now. Want to cut through the grove with me, Ivy? Your father told me that you have big plans you can show me. Papa looked at his watch. I will pull the truck over to the house and meet you and Ivy there in half hour. Then I'm afraid it will already be time to take you back to the bus station. Mama smiled. I will make some sandwiches with the leftovers. Kenny stood and put on his hat. Goodbye, Mrs. Lopez. Thank you for everything. I hope I will meet Fernando someday soon. Mama became teary-eyed and opened her arms to hug him. Kenny looked surprised, but he hugged her back. Outside, as they walked through the orange grove, Kenny took a deep breath. It's funny what you miss when you're away from home. I miss the smell of the orange trees, my mother's cooking, and my little sister's arguing over whose turn it is to be first for anything. And I miss wearing civilian clothes like your jacket. Is that your brother's? Fernando gave it to me until he comes home. So I would remember he is keeping me safe and warm even from far away. Kenny smiled. I'm glad our families have decided to survive this war together, Ivy. I think we're more alike than different. Your father told me you signed up for orchestra. Did you know I was in the orchestra too and my sisters? They play flute. Mr. Daniels was our teacher. I, I played. The violin said, Ivy, I know. I saw a picture in your house. Do you like Mr. Daniels? He's my favorite teacher, said Ivy. I like how he talks. He told us we have to play majestically.
Kenny laughed. That sounds like Mr. Daniels. Kenny was easy to talk to, and before she knew it, Ivy found herself telling him about the first day of orchestra and how the boys had laughed at her because she was from Lincoln Annex and how Mr. Daniels had put a stop to it. She told him about playing when Johnny comes marching home, how she hoped to play the flute and wished she could go to Lincoln, Maine. Some of the parents are asking why the school district is paying for a music teacher during a war, but Mr. Daniels says everyone needs a little beauty and light in their lives, especially during the worst of times. Kenny nodded. Mr. Daniels is right. Can you play the harmonica for me? I know you have it with you, he winked. Your father told me you carry it everywhere and play beautifully. Papa had said that? She blushed and pulled the harmonica from her pocket, but then hesitated. Kenny prodded and teased her like Fernando would have. Just one song, please. I don't want to have to pull your braids again. When he reached out and threatened, she laughed. Kenny didn't seem so grown up now. He just seemed like someone's big brother. Ivy played Auld Lang Syne and let herself fill on the wondrous tone of her harmonica. Here within the trees, it seemed as though time stood still. She closed her eyes, riding the notes until she was inside the song. She saw Kenny and Donald and Tom in the wagon, making a fort with crates, playing hide-and-seek and catch, and Susan taking piano lessons from Mrs. Yamamoto. Her mind drifted back to playing jacks with Araceli, jumping rope a hundred times double dutch without missing, and seeing her in the doorway wearing the purple hat and blowing kisses. She trilled the last note, making it sound like a piccolo. When she opened her eyes, Kenny was nodding his approval, Ivy could tell by the faraway look in his eyes that he had remembered things, too. I just realized that this author has done that in every story. Um, towards the end of each story, we have seen Mike go back in his mind as he was playing. When he was performing, trying to get in the harmonica band, he went back in his memory while he was playing, and Friedrich did the same thing. Um, very interesting. You have promised, Ivy, when I come home again, you will have learned the flute. Practice so I can come to a concert one day and sit in the audience while you perform on stage. She smiled, warmed by his words. He made her feel like things were possible, just as Miss Delgado and Mr. Daniels had. She hoped that someday it would be true, that she'd be on stage in front of him and that he'd be proud of her. Even though he was somebody else's brother, he felt like he belonged to her, at least for this afternoon. They came through the last row of trees to the Yamamoto's backyard. Ivy showed Kenny the shed and the seedlings and the war garden, and she told him her plans for the orange and vegetable stand. Oranges for war bonds. I like that, he said. When Kenny saw the flag with the blue star hanging on the boards over the front door where Papa stood waiting, Ivy saw his lip quiver. He strode over to Papa and clasped his hand and said, I thank you for everything, and my father thanks you. They signed the papers which would bind their families forever, right on the hood of the truck. On the way to the bus station, they drove by Lincoln, Maine. Papa told him all about his efforts so Ivy could go there. Sir, I hope the lawyer can do some good, said Kenny. He is optimistic. There was a case near San Diego in 1931, Roberto Alvarez versus the Lemon Grove School District with the same circumstances. The parents organized and they won, but only in a lower court. The lawyer says he can use this to plead the case. And the more parents who come forward to tell their children's stories, the better it will be for all children who follow. I am going to tell Ivy's story. Kenny Yamamoto nodded. That is good, sir. Everyone needs to fight for someone on the battlefield or at home. Papa pulled up to the bus terminal and turned off the motor. Kenny turned to Papa. Mr. Lopez, sir, I've been thinking about what I might send to my family that could be of some comfort to them in the internment camp, something that won't be too difficult to be bring back home with them some day. Would you mind packaging and sending my sister's flutes? They're in that music room you discovered and have their names on them. Of course, said Papa. He looked at Ivy and winked. Everyone needs a little beauty and light, especially during the worst of times, right? She smiled. What about you? He shook his head. 
I can't very well carry a violin on the battlefield. Ivy pulled the harmonica. <clears throat> Oops. Lost my place. Ivy pulled the harmonica from her pocket and turned it in her hands, running her fingers over the shiny cover plate with its beautiful engravings and the mysterious letter M. She was overcome with a feeling of wanting to help Kenny. Impulsively, before she could climb, he could climb down from the cab, Ivy grabbed his hand, pressed the harmonica into it, and closed his fingers around it. He looked at it and then at her. Are you sure? Ivy nodded. I promise I'll bring it back to you someday. Kenny slipped it into the chest pocket of his uniform, climbed down from the cab, and closed the truck door. Then he stepped forward so he could see Ivy and Papa through the window shield and saluted. Ivy saluted back and whispered, I know. I'm finished. What about you? called Ivy. Okay, so you should be able to answer, what did Ivy do with the harmonica? Okay, now we're looking for who is the mysterious boy. I'm finished. What about you? called Ivy. Susan's head popped up from where she was working on a sign for Mrs. Yamamoto's stand. All morning they had weeded around it, swept out spider webs, and each painted a piece of plywood to lean against each side of the stand so cars might see their message coming from either direction. Since Papa signed the agreement with Kenny Yamamoto six weeks ago, a huge wave of relief seemed to have washed over all of them. Mama and Papa still clung to the belief that the war would end soon. Fernando's letters had been arriving in batches. They might not hear from him for two weeks, but then they would get four letters and one mail delivery, all filled with questions and excitement about the new home. Ivy received one letter from Araceli. She and her family were moving to another state. Ivy had written her back but hadn't received another letter in return. Somehow she knew she might never, not ever hear from Araceli again. Even so, if they were lucky enough to meet once more, Ivy knew they'd pick up where they left off as best friends. Orchestra had started in earnest and Mr. Daniel's prediction had come true. Ivy had fallen in love with the flute. He called Ivy his star pupil and said the only student who had ever come close to her ability was Karen Yamamoto. Ivy couldn't wait to meet her someday. Ivy ran, ran around to see Susan's sign. It's perfect. Coming soon. Oranges for war bonds. Ten cents a bag or one war stamp. God bless America. When do you think we can start selling, asked Susan. Papa said the oranges are ready by the first of March, so next week. Later we'll do vegetables. I'm glad your dad said you could help. He said anything for the war effort that will bring our boys home sooner. He's even going to give us some of the vegetables from our garden. Zucchini for war bonds, said Susan. Green beans for war bonds, giggled Ivy. Asparagus for... The boy on the bicycle rode past them. His white shirt sleeves rolled up, his blue pants tied at the ankles with string as usual. He wore the same blue cap with an emblem and carried the same pouch slung across his chest. Ivy waved, but he was pedaling quickly and didn't respond. He never waves back, she complained to Susan. But Susan didn't answer and the color had drained from her face. Susan... What is it? The boy. Susan looked as if she might faint. Ivy pulled her to the bench and sat down next to her. You know who he is? Ivy. Everyone knows who he is. Susan's eyes were big pools of green. She looked down the road. Did he turn at the crossroad or go straight? Straight, I think. What does it matter? asked Ivy. Remember I told you how we found out that Donald was killed? Yes, a telegram, right? Susan nodded. It was brought to our house by a Western Union messenger, that boy on the bicycle. Susan's hands began to tremble. Okay, so who's the boy? The boy is a messenger for the company Western Union who delivers tele telegrams. Okay, and it's lots of times bad news for families that are waiting to hear about their soldier. Um, which way was he riding? Did he turn toward my house? No, Ivy said. He turned toward mine. She shivered and grabbed Fernando's jacket from where she'd tossed it, 
her head filled with a loud buzzing. Were there bees nearby? And then she heard music, the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Ivy stood. At first she walked up the Yamamoto's drive and then ran. She cut through the grove and wove around trees, oranges thudding to the ground as she knocked into them. Her feet and heart pounded. She could hear Susan behind her. Ivy! Ivy! He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Ivy ran so fast she felt dizzy. Still the music played on. When she reached the edge of the grove, she had to stop and bend over to catch her breath. She grabbed her side. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Susan came up behind her and put an arm around Ivy's waist. They took a few steps toward, forward together, past the last of the trees, until Ivy's house came into view. The bicycle leaned against the porch, and the boy stood at their door. His truth is marching on. Okay, so where was the boy going? He stopped at Ivy's house. And what questions does this leave us with? This leaves us with, uh uh-oh, has something, well, really, what has happened, right? What has happened to Fernando? It could be that he was killed, but it could be that he was injured. It could be he was missing in action. There were some of those telegrams, too, that someone went out to help and they couldn't find them. There's lots of news that they could receive from this. So you can see the word four from the background. That is the end of section three, and we're all going, ah, they always leave us in these cliffhangers, right? So give me your best prediction on what you think is going to happen in section four. How do you think all of these stories are going to come together? And what are some things you think we're going to find out? Okay, give me your best um, good reader predictions, and we'll start section four tomorrow.